there is a key question that can actually also serve as a guidance. It's not what the future will look like, you know, the, the WTF question, what's the future, but it's actually, how do we want to live? How do we want to live, you know, with each other and the planet? And this is kind of like, it's an opening question because it's, um, it makes us um, game changers. We can shape our future and we have to do it responsibly. Dr. Thomas Yuli is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. The spirit of human business, how to rediscover our human being to shape our future, right here in my hands, big and yellow, one of my favorite colors. And I got the copy not too many days ago. I actually got it before Thomas. And I'm so excited to be uh, here again with my good friend Thomas to talk about this book Thomas is a human business architect, co-creator, and coach for Agile Project and Business Transformation with more than 25 years of experience in various industries and companies. He is the founder, business leader, and trustee of motivate to be a collective for leaders, teams, and entire organizations with the common goal of making business and their companies more human and sustainable. In 2020, he joined Allianz as an executive to help us transformation into an agile organization and onwards into human business. His first book, Leadership Principles for Project Success, was published in 2011 by CRC Press, New York City. He holds a PhD in International Studies from the University of Miami, in the United States and a Master of Arts in Economics from Washington University in St. Louis in the United States, where he was a student of Nobel laureate Douglas C. North. His company is called, obviously, motivate to be and I'm so glad to have you here, Thomas. It's good to see you. How are you, brother? Well, I'm doing great. I'm really happy and I'm delighted to be back on your podcast. Well, we talk in between. It's, uh, I have to apologize that it's a lot of what's up back and forth. You and I are both busy. We uh, have so many things going on. But one thing I love about you is that you know how to always stay in touch and, and you're, you're good at nudging me and, and making sure uh, that I'm in alignment and that we, we align on many things. I recently reached out to you uh, um, and we, we had a call because we're discussing kind of our game plan for the, um, the uh, beginning of next year, hopefully for the World Economic Forum and the Davos Tour. And we had a nice dialogue. Since then, it's still up in the air, still turmoil. Is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? The open forum is definitely closed. Um, but at that time, you helped me immensely. It was right before I was getting ready to go to uh, speak at Block Chance here in Hamburg at the Parliament building about um, a future emerging technologies, not just cryptocurrencies, but blockchain and how we can use emerging technologies in our life. And I asked you a question and you gave me a wonderful answer. Um, but I'm going to ask it to you again to see if it has changed right out of the get-go um, as we start our conversations today, because I think it's so important, especially important with your book. And um, so I want to ask you, what models are you operating on in a personal and business or work life? So in your personal life, I'm sure you have a model, whether it's an economic model or a model that you operate under. And then in your business or work life, not only motivate to be, but for Allianz, uh, you have maybe a different model that, that you operate on. And I wanna ask, what are those models? Are they aligned? And are they going in the same direction? And how do you, how do you juggle that? Yeah, well, that's an excellent question. And it is a difficult one because like, 
Well, the question is like, if there is only one model um, or, you know, if there's something different or mix or hybrid. Um, uh, honestly, I think where, where I've come from, because I've worked in, in project and program management for so many years, um, people would say it's more a mechanical problem, you know, maybe even Tayloristic in nature. Um, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, definitely since I started writing the book, um, it's, it's, it's really what I call a human business model. And it's like I tried to walk my own talk. It's like um, rediscovering myself and um, trying to create the space for myself as well as for others. And so therefore it's not something artificial, but it's something it's more, it's, it's within us. You can say that's like, it's a human being. It shouldn't sound esoteric because it's not, um, because it's all about us. Um, so I'm trying to bring this into, into my, my daily life uh, which is a challenge, and it's also to my uh, uh, professional life, and that too is, is, is a challenge because, like, again, because we have function, we can, I guess, that we can, I can say, and the mechanical Tayloristic world for so many decades, it's sometimes difficult to break out and to be more authentic and uh, discovering who we are, what we, what really matters, and especially in times of crises. Um, so this is like what I'm, I'm working on. This is like my, can you say my, my North star and I wouldn't dare call myself, myself an expert. I'm exploring. And that's uh, the wonderful part of it. Do you, would you, would you call that exploring almost like an evolution in, in life? Um, it's an evolution. I think it has to do something with maturing, has to do something with growth. And um, now when I reflect on my life, I'm um, 53, 53 years old. Um, I wish I had known this, like quite a few things much, much earlier. Um, starting with vulnerability and uh, acknowledging my own emotions uh, in daily life and in business. And um, when I'm speaking with my, my kids, I mean, they're already 18 and 20 years old. Um, I think they're more mature than I am, um, and, you know, sometimes uh, because they ask me provocative questions and um, that make me think and reflect uh, what I'm after. I love that. So the last time we had a recording or you were on the podcast, it was about the book in German. It was a uh, you know, human business in German. And I asked you, I believe I asked you on the podcast, it says, When's it coming out in English? And uh, uh, luckily, I mean, we, we've had this hellacious, crazy time, and you write about it in the book, about the COVID and the lockdown and, and all the craziness uh, on, on work and what we've experienced. Was it a blessing to, to have this time? And, and even though you've still worked, the world hasn't stopped for you um, to have that time to to work on the book to get it out in english and also uh, make some updates and revisions and, and a, a few changes i'll tell you and, and just compare for those viewers who are not listening only on audio and looking at this uh, uh are you telling me that german into english turns into biblical terms or did you <laughs> add that much more well, the there is some some yeah, I added a, a few things. Uh, you know, there's also a wonderful forward by Steve Denning. Um, and I think that's that's I, I think it's it's kind of like a highlight, you can say. If people don't have time to, to read the uh, the forward, I think they really can get a lot out of it. And then probably afterwards they want to read the book. Um, the layout is different and um it allowed me, the publisher allowed me to stress the the real key points and, and also to show it more, to say, more graphically, and it's easier to read. And I think the content by itself, you can say, is the same. Uh, there are some nuances that changes some updates, but uh, it's, and yet it feels completely different. At least to me, it feels different. It's, it's, it, it is as if the energy is different. And um, it since, is different. I'll, I'll tell you that right now. So I, I've, I've read it. So not only is the data, uh, not so much German data, it's a, two case studies uh, that are different and, and uh, uh, data from from more from the US kind of a, of a market and not so much German data, uh, but it has that different feel. And normally this is unusual because 
when you translate German into English, it would be less words. But if you try to put something in English into German, you're like, boy, Germans have like 15 more words to describe the same one or two English words. There's this whole sentence, you know, I mean, Germans are famous for, for these long run on sentences or these, you know, I leg in a boy may saw huge, huge words. And so um, I, it's amazing, but it is so great to read. It's beautiful. It, it, it's there. So I thank you for that. But I mean, I, I just want to say definitely it is. It is a different feel. It's not, any, not, not it's better. It's, it's not saying that the first one was bad, but now you've got a whole new world of opportunities. No, it, it's um, kind of like it was an inner calling to, to actually translate it. And I, I translated, I think, uh, uh, I think it was earlier this year in January or so. Um, and edited it, and then I was uh, actually curious, like uh, you know, if uh, if I can find a U.S. publisher or an English publisher, and I thought probably they will say, "Oh gosh, not!" It's like we have to copy edit everything, but they were quite pleased. Change a little bit, but um, it was um, just like I can say translating and editing it was as if I had as if I was writing it again. Um, it had a different feel to it, and. Well, the, the German title, human business, it just was just human business. And I, to me, it was like there was always something missing. So I changed to the spirit of human business because when you just talk about human business, the, the, paradigm, or the, the paradigm, the model I'm describing in the book, that's one thing, but there is more to it. And that's the spirit. This is like really about the rediscovering our own humanity and then translating or applying it to our daily life, to our business. And then, or thus, you may be revolutionizing business and the world. I, I'm totally in agreement with you. There are a few other things that uh, uh, somber, honestly, and, and that I want to touch upon. So in the book, uh, you, you do a pizza call every so often. You've also interviewed a lot of people for for this work and, and kind of the pizza calls I me mean, is kind of about the time it would take to eat a pizza and, and call and you call up and, and, and meet with these people who you consult with, who you speak with. Some are my friends, uh, um, some I don't even know yet, uh, Julia von Winterfell, Kim Pullman, and many others that you've, you've kind of um, went through and, and had in the book. Um, one of them that you write about pretty pretty much in the beginning is John Naisbitt, and he actually passed away. He was rather up there in the age age group anyway, and I had his wife, Doris Naisbitt, on, on, the, on the show, on a podcast, and he actually passed away during the COVID. Um, but the reason I, I bring it up is this was a hellacious time, and it still is it turning out to be in, in many respects for all of us. And this book, and that's why I'm so glad it's in English, is more important than ever. Not only did, did you write about it, you talk about the case studies and you talk about how do we humanize business? How do we make it more humane in the future? And many other things that, that we'll discuss throughout this call. But now we've, those who, who didn't know this before have really, truly experienced it. And they're, and they're searching. They're looking for to make sense uh, uh, of a lot of this. So sense making and, and things. And they're also understanding when we spoke before about this metamorphosis, this uh, traditional transition to, to human business, you know, this uh, that you mentioned VUCA. And I, I want you to kind of to tell us about that. I want you to say, so why do you think this is more important than ever? Mm -hmm. And what have you experienced by those who've now gotten the book in English and, and been through this horrific time? What are they saying to you about the future of business, about their world? Well, well, that's a, that's a, you know, it's like a you know, very, very universal um, question, you can say, and let's, let's put it this way. Um, my experience at, uh, at Allianz, um, I've been with the, with the corporation now for 18 months, a uh, great time. And uh, people ask me, actually, Steve Denny asked me, why, why on earth would you go to such a big corporation? I said like, well, when you work on your own, you can only influence 
so many individuals, but working within a corporation, uh, an international corporation such as Allianz is completely different. And what I've been observing is that even in large corporations, things are changing. Uh, it's yes, you still have you know a traditional business; they just focus on uh, shareholder value, etc. But it's like um, more and more companies realize it's not enough because you have to work for talents. You know, it's like very; it's become more and more difficult to attract young talents, um, highly skilled workers, and then the you know that you want to retain them, and they just don't. They, they want more than just a job. Uh, they want something they can identify with. They want to have, they want to work some, for something bigger, something grander. Uh, they would like to, they ask them questions about what's the purpose of the company? And if the purpose of a company is, so we, we want, just want to maximize profits, the question is like, hey, what good does it do to the customer? How can it help me besides like have a paycheck? Um, they would like to say, what, let's say if they, there was, what was it? I think, um, I think it was Zappo or so in the book on Zappo. And they asked like, would you be willing to uh, get a tattoo with a company logo? And kind of like, do you identify with a company? Um, well, I, I wouldn't get it, you know, tattoo, but with, with Allianz or so maybe motivated to be, but this gives you an idea. Like do you, how far, how much do you identify with the company? What it's the business it's in and uh, what good or bad it does. And in working with, with so many people, uh, within the Allianz and also outside, they talk about what what makes work special, and that's the human experience. It's the interacting, it's the co-creation, the collaboration. This makes all the difference. And people say, if I'm still treating as a, just a resource, uh, I don't want to be resource, you know, because I don't want to keep competing with computers. I have so much more to offer. Um, you know, I'm creative and I, I know, you know, I just want to have fun with, with other people, joy. And, you know, you can do quite a few things virtually. Okay. Then the other day we had like, um, that was before the, the, the latest lockdown, we had a workshop in person. It was a creative workshop and it was like, we were just blown away, by you know, how much we get the, the, all the ideas. So people appreciate the human interaction much more uh, than prior to COVID, to the, pan to the pandemic. And this is also reflected in the business more and more. You know, it takes a while, but you can see it in daily business, you know, and daily work, you know, on the outside. Um, that's sometimes a different, that's a different uh, a chapter, but I'm, I'm looking from the inside, what happens within a company and I can see, you know, a changing spirit for the better. You also referred to me, uh, who was also on the podcast, uh, Richard Sheridan. Um, uh, I was connected to Kim Pullman before, but we, she was also on the podcast. Tony Shea, who you just mentioned, he passed away last uh, 2020 and uh, uh, Thanksgiving time, uh, or you know November. Um, <clears throat> so, so we've lost some people, and there's been some some pretty chaotic things that that have happened and, and occurred and people are at this stage of real reevaluation of their lives, the models that they live, how they work, where they work and, and what are they willing to give in to if they work for a big corporation, what are they willing to do and give in? What are the products look like? What are their services? What does their time at these organizations look like? And, and that's exactly what you've, you've brought up and, and talked about, um, it takes effort, it takes discipline. And you, you've mentioned this before, and you mentioned it in the beginning of the book, you mentioned VUCA. Why do you mention VUCA? What, why, um, and, and why does it take discipline? Why do you also mention the butterfly effect, which comes, you know, it, it, it comes from many out there speaking about it, but Kim Pullman as well, talks about this metamorphosis and this transition. Um, tell us about that. Why, why is that important? And how does that relate to this period of time? Yeah, the, the VUCA, you know, this, what, that we live in a volatile, you know, you know uncertain, uncertain, complex, and, 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 and ambiguous um, um, world where we don't know what, what's going to happen to say in a year or so, because like there is so much uncertainty. There, it's so, there is so much complexity. So we are overwhelmed. 
and the workplace and actually business is awesome. And you can have a strategy, but who knows what's going to happen? I mean, internationally, politically, it's like, we, we just don't know. So the question like, what is it? We need a new compass. We need a new, new, new North Star. What is it? Is it just like, so um, maximizing profits, you know, satisfying uh, shareholder needs and or expectations, or what is it beyond? And if you just like, you know, use the old tools and approaches that actually have some cost, some of this uncertainty, uh, it would be kind of like an oxymoron. It just like wouldn't work. Why would you use the same tools to solve something and the tools actually create the problem? It's just like, it's, it just doesn't make sense. So the question is like, wh where do we start? And um, okay, the question is like, why are we in business in the first place? What do we really need? It's not shareholders, but we do need our customers. So it starts with a customer, you know? It's not enough to, to satisfy customers due to the competition, you have to delight the customer. If you want to delight the customer, you have to understand the needs of a customer. So it's not just on superficial, but also on, the, on a deeper need. And maybe not just like the existing customers, but you want to look beyond because the market is changing. Maybe you can identify non-customers, you know, customers that we don't have, haven't attracted yet, but we will see what their needs are. And um, then, you know, build products and services. And that's one thing. So we want to generate value for the customer because otherwise they're not going, to buy, not going to buy anything. But the question then is, who is generating the value? And it's not the shareholders, but it's the employees. So it's interestingly, we talk about product and process innovation and not too many people or not too many companies talk about people innovation because if the, it's the people who actually innovate, not the product and processing. So we actually start with people innovation. So therefore, the purpose of a company is not just to generate value for the customers, but actually also to generate value for the employees, because otherwise they wouldn't, they wouldn't stay with the company. And it's, this is not that you just give them lots of money, but you want to give them something like uh, a work environment they feel um, secure, where they can uh, unfold their potential, um, where they can experience joy, and they learn. Um, and yes, of course, look at the productivity, et, et cetera. But the question is what kind of environment you need. When you generate value for the customer and the employee, the outcome is basically value for the business. Uh, and it's not an art, it's not, doesn't happen automatically. I mean, you still have to look into, you know, cost structures, et cetera, but it's, it's often, it's just a result of the uh, first, uh, set, you know, uh, factors of, Said delighting customers and building a happy workplace. So this is like you have the three pillars, customer, employee, and the business, and you have to look at it uh, holistically. And uh, this is basically also what I've been observing at uh, very innovative, uh, progressive companies. And this is also what I've been, you know, introducing now at, with, uh, within Allianz. And uh, it's quite promising what I can see. So not, not only you, um have been coming out with new books and, and really doubling down on how we can uh, not, not, I definitely not go back to the, the, to normal or even the new normal that we um, realize the long-term value of, of how we do business and how we make that humane. And, and you mentioned it, that, um, in the beginning is that that it's not only we not want to go back to this new normal, but that we're at this most volatile time in the book, you, you make a statement, let us kill HR. Yes. Oh, that was, that was this summer. I, I wrote an article on, on, on LinkedIn. Let's kill HR. And it's still true. Let's kill human resources. Um, we don't need HR because we're not a human resource, we're human beings. Um, and if HR treats people as resources, cost factors, it's missing what it's all about. It's again, it's like, it, it, it's supposed to be there for us to, to help to assist and support the employees and not to treat them as resources, as things, as, as products. And, and I'm, I'm saying, well, it's not about human resources, it's actually more about human recognition. 
And uh, Dave Ulrich, uh, he, he replied, he's like, well, yes, it is about human recognition. It's not, um, it's not about resources, but we still have the term. I, I think that still the term HR is like so outdated. Um, there was a program at, uh, again, also at Allianz, they had said, it says agile at HR. And I said like, you have to change this. It's an oxymoron. Agile and human resources, agile is telling us there are no human resource, there are people. So we changed the program to, and now it's called Agile at People. It makes all the difference because people know right away it's for the people. Um, so just like making these small changes can have, it's, it's a signal, it's, uh, it's a message. And you know it starts with a message. Of course, you have to walk the talk, but it starts right there. Um, before I kind of get into some of the, I want to touch upon some of the other reads that have come out during this time. Same thing uh, on humane business and and um, how how we're going to do it. We're we're talking about metaverse. We're talking about these emerging technologies, these new worlds, new ways of going into work. Um, before I do that, I, I want to kind of touch uh, uh, again on um, Kim Pullman shortly. She uh, set the tone and you helped uh, set the tone in the beginning of the book for a pretty good way into the book with this golden rule. Yeah. And this imaginal cell is the book that she wrote and this um, this transformation through this metamorphosis. Um, why why is that important this metamorphosis this change this transformation is that where we're at as humanity um wh why discuss that is that what we need um why did you choose to bring that into well, I think, the discussion yes um a, met a metamorphosis is so much more than transformation and a transformation it's like when people think okay it's, it's a change you can plan you just like move one one step to the next and there's a big project plan everything's just fine with a metamorphosis when you when the caterpillar turns into cocoon it's like it's everything turns into you can say mush it's like it dissolves it's like completely dissolves so you still have the cells but then you have the, the say the DNA cell, DNA cells of I don't know if there's a DNA cell, but it's called a DNA cell, the imaginal cells of the future butterfly, and uh, the old cells of the caterpillar think, oh, this is the end of the world. They are the enemies, and they're trying to kill it. And uh, but the imaginal cells they build a network, they connect, and at the end of the day, this network is uh, stronger and more powerful than the old cells, and um, a butterfly can emerge. For a caterpillar, this metamorphosis is the end of life. For the butterfly, it's just the beginning. When you go to a company, to a business that is undergoing these changes in the, in the so-called VUCA world, it's, it's like a metamorphosis. You have to be willing to dissolve old structures and discover and explore what wants to be emerged. And this is, it takes courage. It takes... Um, uh, experimentation, you know, it's like, because you don't know what, what works best, you know, in the book, I'm talking about agile as a door opener, but, you know, uh, and as a matter of fact, I don't think there are lots of alternatives because you explore and, and in an iterative and incremental fashion and just like one step at a time. And in a metamorphosis, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. It's like, we don't know exactly what the butterfly looks like. You know, it could be moth, could be beautiful butterfly. Maybe it's like a tiny butterfly, who knows? But also think about this. Once you have the butterfly, people say, yeah, but a butterfly doesn't last forever. Well, it's just similar to a caterpillar, but there's one thing, the butterfly can fly. You see things from a different perspective. Um, you can go to different places where, you know, caterpillar would never have been to be able to go there. And, it's a completely different life. So the purpose of, 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 of a caterpillar is not to eat, 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 but eventually to turn into a butterfly. And I think that for business, why are we in business in the first place? To generate value for people. And we do this not through resources, but by people. And so the purpose of a business, of a modern business is human business. 
So well, la- uh, last time we spoke on the podcast, we actually talked about the Center for Humane Technology from Tristan Harris and, and the movie Social Dilemma that was kind of coming out. Um, and kind of the, the direction of that is, is we're worried about a bunch of things. So we're worried about the stealing of our identity, our data as being sold off that, uh, the world's going in this direction that is making us less humane in some some directions, and uh, but also advancing te- in technology in, in many different ways. And that, you know, whether we're talking about Cambridge Analytics or if we're talking about social dilemma or all the craziness that happens, there's some pretty negative aspects of that where. Uh, the direction on some of those things has taken us in the wrong way. And what I see from, from your, your book and from what you write about and those examples um, that, that are in your book, that the direction needs to be this different model. That's why I asked you those questions in the beginning. What are the models that you're functioning on? How, how if, we, if we have those models, we push them out into the future and depending on how that is that is where we're going to be in the future those are the models we're operating now to to reach a certain goal and in your book you you use these case studies not only did you interview and talk to a lot of people but you have these case studies why do we need the case studies why are they there give us the examples of of why you do that and why you include that is that what we need we need to know that this happened in 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 history or or why as humans or why in books why do we always give case studies or examples why is that important i I think we need we need role models um to learn from and in history we have learned through stories you know basically you can say case studies but i think a story is it's it's you know it's a story. You can say it's a story and it's storytelling and that makes all the difference. It, it puts things into perspective and it's much easier to resonate with a story rather than say just numbers. Numbers is just like that, metrics. But if you know, okay, this, these are real people, they experience this and uh, they, have, they have experienced these, these uh, changes, it's completely different. You can actually contact them and say, hey, you know, tell us about your personal experience. Uh, what were the challenges? How did you overcome these challenges? Or do you have some some advice? And and this is like, again, it puts things into perspective. See, when I when you compare, say, German and American business books, uh, management books, um, the German book is like eighty percent content and twenty percent stories. It's difficult to read, and the U.S. it's just like the other way around. Um, you have eighty percent stories, concrete examples, and then twenty percent facts. Um, I think stories can they they stick you know and and, you know a number is a number again it's like uh but do you tell when you have like when you have kids you give them a number or give them an example um and it's easier to recall it's easier to remember um say when you say it was a three or four years ago um when i was in in davos and of course i knew about the refugees in syria etc but it was not after after i went to the uh facebook pavilion and they had this this, the oculus um um what is what's it called quest yes oculus quest and it was like a day in the life of a refugee and she was 12 years old and she she told the story and you could actually see where she she uh, lived with a family in a tent etc this was only a personal story one you know one just one life and watching this and experiencing this um made me change my perspective on the whole refugee crisis um if you say well there are 100 100 you know kids died last year or last week okay that's one thing it's just a number but what if your best friend was killed in that accident? Would you still say, well, just like one person was, done, was killed, you know, it was not too bad. Yeah, but it was your best friend. There is, you know, there's a face to it. There is, um, it's, uh, it's completely different. And that's why it's important to have these, um, you know, case studies, these stories in there. And um, there is this one company, Metafinance, 
uh, it's it's kind of like consulting in the uh, financial industry, and people wouldn't expect like such a company to be a human business, but it is. It has become a human business actually in record time within a very very short time because it realized we have to be well, we have to be competitive. We want to you know keep the best talents. We want to really make a difference, and uh, it's quite fascinating to to read about the story how they basically turn around its business and uh, has become a role model in the industry. There, um, there was another book, and I, I think you've mentioned this in, in uh, the references or somewhere in the book. I, I recall seeing it from John P. Strelicki, The Big Five oh, for yeah. Life. The first book was fabulous, but he wrote a second one called The Big Five for Life Continued. And that was on a specific company that did, they basically did a, a payroll and, and uh, they, they created the systems for um uh, payroll systems to be able to pay nurses and doctors through different shifts and and it sounds pretty honestly just pretty darn boring right they were the most advanced greatest place to work for their canadian company in the world because they'd shift their model to one of human-centered uh, focus, to one that caring about a purpose for existence, which was a purpose for existence for the corporation or the organization and how they run their business and putting value in humanity and in, in human beings and actually putting faces and names behind um, who they work with and what, what that greater purpose is. And so I, I love those examples, but now I, 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 the, I I'm leading you, I'm sorry, but you know I do this. I'm leading you down a pathway of deeper dialogue and discussion for our listeners because it's so vital. I also believe those stories are necessary. I also believe that history based on case studies or past experiences is absolutely vital. But this goes back to the, the, the first question I asked you, what model are you operating on? And I, I want to go not too far back in history and, and tell you that there are more than 20 civilization frameworks that we've had on our planet. Early antiquity, Mesopotamia, Incas, Aztecs, Mayas, the Greeks, the Romans. These were all civilization frameworks, models, structures for how humans kind of have infrastructure and organize and how their city life looked like that are no longer here today. These models, these structures for living are no longer here. And all but two of them are not here because they collapsed because of an ecological or environmental collapse. And to just to make it easy and to simplify it, um, that's food and infrastructure. Those are the basic needs of humanity. That, that's that type of collapse. And the other two collapse because of um, conflict or displacement collapse. So they had a conflict or they were displaced collapse. Um, but they're no longer here. Now, the reason I bring this up is what the hell does this past story or history, big history, that's what it is. It's big history. Now, have to do with what we're talking about now. And, and this is where I throw uh, the wrench in. One, it's big history. And I hope your kids learned it. I know for a fact that I did not learn it. And I did not learn it the way I'm presenting it to you or in depth. What it truly means uh, about, I, I learned about the Greeks and the Romans and, and the Incas and the Aztecs, but in a much different way, didn't truly understand what it meant. And, and then as an adult, and maybe you have done this as well, you go to these places where the ruins are, the Colosseum, the Parthenon or whatever, and you take a selfie, you're on vacation, you take a selfie and, and you post it on the internet, but you don't really understand what it, what it means. What it is, it's a story. It's a case study. Um, and all, all of those stories or those case studies or that big history they all operated on the same model. And that's why I asked you that question. They all operated on the same model. And you know what that model was? 
a hierarchy model. Hmm. They all had a hierarchy model where there was a ruler, a king, a nobleman, or someone at the top. And then they had this pyramid. And at the bottom were the slaves, the laborers, the farmers, the, um, the people who did all the work and built the infrastructure. And there's so many different experiences, whether it's ancient China, whether it's current China, whether it's um, the Incas, Aztecs, or Mayas, whether it's the pharaohs, all of them had this hierarchy structure. And when we talk about business, we talk about uh, metamorphosis, we talk about circular economy, we talk about regeneration, we talk about different business models that have a different structure where everybody has an input. There's no, buddy, there's no division of class, so to say. And so to throw the wrench in, do those stories, those case studies really help because we've continued in history, we've proven that we're not listening. We just, when, when we get in an economic bubble, when we come close to collapse, we just do a bailout and then we go right back to the same model that we had before. And so is that really what we need to make a shift to get um, us a humane business to get us for? And how, how does that apply? I know that's pretty far out there and I'm pulling, yes. but it's not, it, it, it's really not. I, I want, how do we get back to humane? How do we build those infrastructures to get us, uh, get us into the future that we want, that we're both working towards? Well, I think actually, even in nature, you can have a hierarchy. However, it's not static, it's adaptive, it's flexible. And that is the key. You can still have a hierarchy in a, in a, in a business, but it needs to be adaptive. Given the, depending on the situation, so it can change from one situation to the next. Um, in a team, let's say in a team setting, you have you can have like a circular, you can say circular hierarchy. You know, if there's something like this, you have certain rules and responsibilities, and they change depending on what the challenges are. Um, so I still believe people need some form of structure, some form of orientation, and some people need a hierarchy, but it has to be adaptive. It has to be adaptive to the needs and to the circumstances. If that's the case, you can evolve. If you if it's static, if it's bureaucratic. Uh, it tries to to keep and to save the secure the the, uh, the status quo, but the status quo is just like it's it's right now in the moment. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. In the VUCA world, it's it, forget it's a dead end. Um, so therefore, you know bureaucracies. Okay, if you live in a, if you function of you if you do business in a, an environment which does not change. Go for it. Bureaucracy just works fine. It's like efficient efficiency, what have you. However, whenever you want to be innovative, it just doesn't work. You need to have, you know, kind of like a structure and certain rules that help you actually become innovative. A structure such as like, you know, a structure is not a bureaucracy. Um, and an example uh, is like the ABC, the alphabet. You have certain rules, you know, how you uh, coin words and you have grammar and then you communicate. Or you have the, the musical notes, eight musical notes and half tones and you have the rhythm. You can make music or you have the three colors and what have you this is structure and then you have certain rules how you put everything together but we do need much more the more complicated the more complex the structures the less of an orientation they provide and therefore it becomes complicated to learn them so uh, kids learn best well what kind of structure they have they need a sense of security and they just explore um, they're curious so they just want to go for it uh, natural discoveries you can say and whenever we have structures in place that impede us from this, you know, explorer, explorer inside, it's, I don't know, it's just like holds us back. We cannot progress. We cannot mature. Um, so therefore, I think the model, again, what we need is, it's a, it's a human model. Now, and then when you look at, it's like, if you look at some of the, the, the say, hierarchies that, that, that didn't make it, you know, that didn't last very long. Why? Because they were static. And the thing is, is all of the high, all of the the ones that collapsed, all those that are not here anymore, they all had the same hierarchy model. They weren't, they did, they they all had that same model, and they all collapsed. And I believe there's there's an updated um, or or even kind of different way of looking at it. It's not only that 
did they all collapse uh, be because of that model, whether it was a dictatorship or, um, you know, uh, a communist or fascist or, or whatever, it uh, comes to something even closer. And it, uh, um, that was kind of misunderstood. And I'd like to get your feelings on this because this ties to the humane factor, to the human factor. Um, if we go to, uh, you probably heard of the terms neoliberalism or neo-Darwinism. It's basically a concept that means, you know, natural selection, only the strong survive, survival of the fittest, severe competition, which we see in organizations and businesses and models all around. My religion's better than your religion. Um, my religion's the only true religion. There's only, there's only, it's this games theory where there's only one winner. It's a win and a lose situation um, uh, instead of a win-win situation. And, and most of the time it's a lose-lose situation. Um, but that's not the way our world works. And so you've heard me mention the terms regeneration before uh, uh, as a model or a symbiosis. And even in your book, you, you mentioned the terms chaos, complex, that these are systems that are pretty complex that, that we have to think of that are hard to, to wrap our, our, our minds around. But that's not the way the world works, not the chaos, not the complexity, that, that's definitely in our world. But this natural selection, survival of the fittest, the human condition that we have let, been led to believe that only the strong survive. That was kind of a misrepresentation of Darwin, which has to do with, with human beings. The way our world does work is through symbiosis, through regeneration, that we work in cooperation with everything else on our planet, all other species, that we crawled out of the primordial soup of this earth, that we are an integral part of all all of humanity, all other species and our planet, and that the only way we're going to go far, the only way we're going to fix a lot of the problems we have, especially as an organization, which is just a sub level of organism, we're an organism in this big organism. Um, Carl Sagan said it best. Um, there's this new collective consciousness emerging that sees the world, the earth as a single organism and an organism divided amongst itself is doomed. And so the reason I say that, how do we, how do we use that thinking or shift that thinking in, in a paradigm shift for humanity to realize that the structure isn't hierarchy, that the structure is um, tied to collapse and it's something that we've been continuing to repeat and you deal with that more than anything and so I guess more than anything is my question is um, regarding your book haven't you run across that that the organization model is so vital on how it's structured if it's a if it's a company that's got a limit to growth or will experience these times in the future, whether it's it's far or short term, where they're going to hit a bubble or a collapse themselves, because it's the wrong model. It's not a humane model. It's not a regenerative model. Well, the, I think Darwin maybe he was he was right when he said like when he talked about survival of the fittest. But the fittest was not necessarily the strongest, but those uh, you know creatures you know that actually could adapt. The best through changing environment so it's about adaptive and uh, you know a behavior that makes all the difference so that's the fit uh behavior so therefore we need to have an organization that is um open for you know adapting to changing um circumstances um so I say and that's why i think there is you know agile is has a has an advantage because you work in you know iterations you know in increments and then every after each iteration you reflect what have we learned how can we come how can we become better this continuous self-improvement and it's like doesn't always have to be faster and, and and stronger but just like you reflect and you're willing to let go of old patterns um, just because you have sunk costs does not mean that you maybe you, there comes a point where you have to give it up at, after all and this is like where people say no we can't do this we have invested so much money yes fine 
But if we find out it's not useful anymore, why do you want to continue building it? So go on, go ahead and go to the open the next chapter and see what you can do. So organizations need to need to be definitely need to be flexible. Um, they have to be flexible means they have to be you can say faster. And just because like let's say when companies they know with the pandemic they built uh, these you know uh, huge buildings office buildings and now they they realize oh well people are working from home and we don't need these office buildings anymore and who do we know what do we know what the office of the future will look like you know how many people actually will, will actually come to work uh, or is it just that you work from wherever you are um and how will it change the the way that we, we work together at all but then on the other hand we also know that working together with the human interaction it is very special you know virtually you can do a lot of things virtually but there is it's not a substitute for a real interaction um so what kind of company do you want to build that actually accommodate this as well and you know the corporation i'm working right now this 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 is like some some of the discussions we have and i'm asking sometimes like why do you what i mean you want some people they say okay tell me what the, the office would look like in five years and i tell them it's like i don't know well we have to let you have to let us know right now it's like, well, okay, build it in a way that we can change it within two weeks. Well, we can't do this. I say, well, what do you expect me to, to tell you? It's like, maybe there's another pandemic. Maybe it's like, maybe we're a completely different business. So um, do, do we know what, what the world will look like in five years? No, uh, the same applies to, to office buildings, et cetera. And the, the other thing, you, what you mentioned is like co collaboration, co-creation, uh, that we're not well, yes, we're individuals, but we're not isolated individuals. We're, you know, social beings. And it's not just about the human attractions. We live in environments. So we look at society and the, uh, the, the natural environment. So that's why the goal and rules adapted to say, treat the other and the planet the way you want to be treated. We always have to look at the whole picture and the planet, we're part of the planet, but just like pieces of it. But we have to look at the overall um, uh, picture and we have to, be, how should I say, more conscious about um, what we're doing and what the side effects is, not just about uh, that impact us, but maybe uh, the, the next generation and the next seven generations after. Uh, we, are, you know, we have a responsibility for it. And if we do this, I believe, and kind of like, not just be overly cautious because we make mistakes. I think it's, it's, a, it's a better environment, you know? Um, and this is something, it's complete contrast to the static bureaucracy. And what I'm saying is like those companies, those businesses, and actually also those societies or, you know, that are more open for this kind of change, that embrace change rather than just like opposing it, they have a better future. They will strive more in the future. I absolutely uh, uh, agree with you. Uh, I also want to throw in some wrenches there. Um, because there's a couple things that I do think we know, and we, we tend to um, we tend to fool ourselves into thinking that we don't know. Um, we we know very well what the future can be, what it needs to be, and where it needs to go. And so you know from from your book and from your work that you want to do that you want to have a more humane business, a more humane future definitive that that that's the model and that's where you want to go well there is a set roadmap a plan of action and there's things to do to make sure that we have that future and um i i know this is kind of a um this is kind of a crazy example but it, it's uh, it's fitting and i can give you others if you don't like it when john f kennedy um, almost 61 years ago, stood in front of Congress and 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 in the United States, and I hate to give uh, U.S. as the example, but he didn't have the technology, the computing power, and all the science that he needed to put a man on the moon. Well, it, it didn't exist. There was bits and pieces, but the majority of it didn't exist. He had then before the decade was out was his. His famous speech is, he says, before this decade is out, 10 years is a decade to put a man on the moon. And he did it. And, um, and a lot of that technology was then put into place. 
I have seen cities of the future. Songdo, Korea was supposed to be a city of the future. Fintorn, uh, Eden. Uh, I could go on and on. These cities of the future, these cities of new forms of living in the future. In order to build those up, in order to get there to that point in time, there's a, there's a star map, there's a navigation, there's a plan of action of what we need to do to get there. I can, and I want to break it down to something here today. And this is what I want, I know you've included it in your book, and I want to see more of, but I also want to see more discussion of this uh, from you and others, is our, our world is growing around us exponentially, good, bad, and ugly. But us as homo sapiens are on this very linear, siloed, kind of slow path. We're not keeping up with our exponentially growing world. And the example is just on today, the preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school kids that would need to start school um, when school starts again or, or, or today, um, in, in December 10th, we would need to be building 63,000 new classrooms every single week just to keep up with the amount of classrooms we need to teach those, those kindergarten, preschool, and, and first graders. Around the world today, in one month, we built less than 100 classrooms. Yeah. So we're yeah. well behind on the infrastructure, no matter how technically advanced, no matter how, we are, we are extremely far behind. And that was just an example for the, that population today I didn't talk about hospitals or many other uh, you know, roads or, you know, are we building roads because the future is going to be full of cars? What, what is that future and how are we setting up that our model is one that doesn't collapse as well because we invested in stranded assets or we invested or we built our infrastructures in the wrong thing. And in your book, you talk about these trends as you talk about those things that we need to do to make sure we know what that future is. And that, that's that's what I, but we need to be talking about it. I'm not saying, oh, I, I still got to have my job. And so I've got to be careful what I say. So otherwise they're going to, the shareholders are going to get mad at me, you know? And so that's kind of what I want a, a little bit to, to know some more from you. Well, there, I'm not a John F. Kennedy, but you know, the vision I'm describing in, in my book is like that me personally, I want to help contribute to Establishing human business as the new global norm by the year 2030. Do I know? Do I have like a like a, a master plan how to get there? No. Do I have some ideas what I'm going to do next? Yes. You know, and I'm I'm a fan of of projects, little steps, and you know, connecting them, building networks, just like the imaginal cells, one step at a time, explore and learn from each other, and there is a key question that can actually also serve as a guidance. It's not what the future will look like, you know, the, the WTF question, what's the future, but it's actually, how do we want to live? How do we want to live, you know, with each other and the planet? And this is kind of like, it's an opening question because it's, um, it makes us um, game changers. We can shape our future and we have to do it responsibly. You know, we apply the golden rule. This is what Kim Palman talks about in the book. It's not like egoistical and it's like, you know, short-term thinking. No, we have responsibility for this, this generation and the next and the one after. And again, we shouldn't do it cautious. You know, we shouldn't do it over cautiously, but, you know, we explore and use common sense. And um, I, I think we should encourage, especially the younger generation, um, not to be, well, to keep their uh, curiosity and ask questions and try different things. And um, they should not get stuck in this, like, well, you have to do certain things. And these are the goals, like, you know, you have to meet expectations, you have functional resources. Okay, fine, there, there are some advantages to it, no doubt. But let's not give up our, you know, natural sense of curiosity that we want to explore new things, try new things and learn from it. And we learn through playing, through mistakes. Um, so if you're afraid of, make, of making mistakes, okay, don't try to be innovative. You know, this is a normal thing. And therefore this is something I believe we have to encourage the younger generation 
go out there, play, explore, um, act responsibly. And talking about acting responsibly, we have to act responsibly. And maybe and it starts with listening to, acknowledging uh, their strength, their weaknesses, and just go from there. Absolutely love it. You, you discuss, and we've had this discussion privately as well, but um, the importance that boys don't cry, men do. Yep. And it, 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 really, it really is about vulnerability. And, and so I'd like to talk about that um, as well and why, why that plays such a, why is that, it's almost like a compass for human beings, uh, that vulnerability. That's, uh, yeah, when people ask me, it's like, why this book is different, I like to cite that, that chapter about, you know, boys don't cry, men do. Um, maybe it's, it's because like, uh, the last 12 months or so I've been exploring more and more about, you know, this very aspect of uh, um, my own uh, human being and where I had to admit that, yes, me too. I was uh, raised as a kind of like a functional resource. I'm trying to optimize things and, you know, I'm very competitive, um, but I'm missing out so much, you know, and in interacting and actually about myself and it starts with emotions. And, um, Kind of like, well, it's good to have like a bright mind and, and, and plan everything. But, you know, we have, you know, we have three brains. Why do we only want to use this one here in the head? We have the heart, we have the gut, you know, intuition. And uh, bring it all to the table, I think, makes, can make all the difference. And um, it's, it's a struggle, let's put it this way. Um, and just acknowledging and practicing some, how should I say, self-compassion. It's a huge challenge, and um, especially got you know for guys, you know, and, and, and talking about mistakes, you know, where we have where they say, you know, we're afraid of 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 the uh, you know, let's say some challenges. Like I have no idea. Sometimes when I say, you know, I have no idea how to solve a problem at work, and I talk openly about it, and people are still sometimes stunned, surprised that I talk about it openly because I show some weaknesses. But I'm first of all, I'm trying to be honest authentic and maybe also somebody else maybe can help but what kind of environment is it if it's like if i if i cannot talk about my fears and concerns and act and ask for advice and i believe that um especially guys we have a hard time because out of um because of our ego i guess you know false pride and um you know becoming softer is probably the hardest thing at least for me it is um and yet it's probably the most adventurous and most rewarding adventure most uh, you know journey there is and it's the journey and you know to the inside to you know what i'm talking about discovering exploring our human being and um i just wish you know this is something i i would have done much much earlier You already kind of uh, tickled on it uh, a few moments ago about the burning question, um, WTF. It, it's different this time, but it's very similar. It's the hardest question I have for you today. Um, and and I'm, I know you've thought about it quite a bit and, and you've been kind of you, um, reflecting upon it. It's what does a world that works for everyone look like for you, just for you. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Well, that's a tough one. Uh, you got me that one. Um, I'd, like to, I'd, like me, I'd like to have like a sense of, secu uh, sense of security, uh, comfort, um, and yet, it's kind of like an environment where I can explore and make mistakes um, and have some form of guidance. And this guidance uh, can be from the inside being protected and 
the best way to do this is like when I'm saying motivate to be, okay, it starts with me. Uh, when I'm just act, trying to be, to fill a role, it's not about the being. And uh, it's about not, not necessarily about being authentic. So I believe, and this is my hope that in this process, you know, the next couple of years, I can become more authentic, more, you can say human, and thus being a better human to other people. And this goes back to the golden rule, treat the other person and the planet the way I want to be treated. But again, it starts with me. Um, like what, when, you, when, you're, uh, when you're boarding a plane, you know, and they say, well, in case, you know, there is, you know, uh, uh, there is no pressure and stuff, you get the oxygen mask. You know, first, put on the oxygen, oxygen mask before you help the other person. I think this is the same, same thing. Um, I have to learn to find the oxygen mask so I can help other people by walking my own talk. And I admit this is a challenge. Um, and I'm learning. And um, I'm happy and I'm relieved, actually, that I've started this journey. And I wish I would have started much earlier. Yeah, that, that's, uh, I hear that quite a bit. That's an, uh, almost another question. I mean, uh, what would you have liked to know from the start? It's you say that I, I wish I would have started sooner or known it sooner because I would have started. Yeah, fully, fully, you know, listen to, listen to your heart more often and not just like the, you know, to the head. I mean, there were so many decisions I made just from, uh, you know, rational decisions. I read, and my heart told me something completely different and more intuition. And in retrospect, I knew it's like, it would have been much easier if I just had followed my heart and my intuition, not all the time, but in those, you know, particular uh, uh, situations. And um, so next time when I, when I face a decision and I'm not sure what to do, left or right and stuff, I am trying to listen to my intuition, to my heart. And in most cases, it's a better decision. There, there are some interesting things that are, are, are really important um, tied to, to human business and, and to what your writings are in this um, that I want to kind of talk to you about. There are more and more, we're seeing this uh, emerging of new consciousness, a new way of looking at the world, more shift towards uh, the humane anyway towards this adaptive humane future and in in that shift uh, some interesting things have happened so we've heard um, corporate social responsibility which is very old it's uh, more than 10 years old it's uh, 20 years old um, and the social is the human factor in there now we hear environmental social governance ESG and the uh, social aspect is the, the humane part of it. Um, 25 years, I think it's 27 years ago now, John Elkington um, came up with the triple bottom line. Uh, John Elkington wrote the book, uh, Green Swans. You know, it's the opposite of black swans that we've, we've heard of. And um, he came up with people, planet, and profit mm -hmm. the the triple bottom line and it's um was successful for 25 years and then in um and it might it, it, it uh might even be more than 27 years now but in 2018 he said after working on a project with the world business council for sustainable development that he's recalling and in the Harvard Business Review, that he's recalling the triple bottom line. And organizations all over the world had really been using that and seeing fabulous results as an accounting principle. The accounting principle that we had before that was 500 years old. It was a single bottom line and the double bottom line, which was developed by an old uh, Franciscan monk and um, really didn't work at all. It was a kind of really not the way the world works. And then John Elkin came, came up with this and it worked very well. And he's very famous for this triple bottom line. But then he recalled it. And the reason he recalled it was because he said the pro he was moving forward, trying to move forward on some other projects and, and see that. And he realized that everyone was using this triple bottom line 
in the wrong way as an accounting principle that only touched on the profit part of it, but totally neglected the, the, the planet and people. Oh, yeah. And that it was kind of this greenwashing. And he says, enough. I'm recalling it. We need to revamp it. This is, it's not work. We're using it in this greenwashing way and it's just not effective. We're taking the words in our mouth, we're, but, it, but it has no meaning to it. And so he recalled it. And now we're hearing so many things of companies and organizations doubling uh, down on ESG and that it's a better model moving forward. But the key to that model is, is that all environment, social and governance, that they all have this balance of, of how we go in. But the social part, the human part of it, which you discuss is such an, a vital part for us um, to move forward. And so my question is, with, with not only green swans came out a few, a few years ago, and, and I'll touch upon a couple other books, there's more and more wisdoms like this coming up on how we can set up those models, how we can use supportive structures like your book to move forward. How, how are you using that? How are you suggesting we apply those into our life to make sure we help our organizations, we help us personally to move into those futures that we want to see? Um, because there's some, some very strong pushing and pulling going on from metaverses and uh, these virtual worlds that could be good, bad, or ugly, you know, these, um, uh, it's a, how, how are you yeah. kind of addressing that? Let me, let's go from the meta level, maybe to the micro level. Yeah. And uh, meta setting, when you have a daily meeting, like 50 minute, uh, minutes meeting in the morning, or sometimes during the day, you ask the question like, what have I accomplished yesterday? what I'm about to do today, and is there anything I need help with? A um, couple of years ago, I added a fourth question. Actually, this, you know, we usually start the, the meetings with that question, and that is, what will make me happy today? What is it that makes me happy today? Or you can also say, what am I grateful for? And it doesn't have to be related to work. could be anything. And then you collect these happiness uh, factors, and you see... The next day, you ask them, have you achieved your happiness um, thingy or plan, what have you? And then you talk about it. And after a while, you have something, you collect these ideas and you have like a, what I call a happiness wall. And you kind of like, okay, what kind of environment do we need to be happy, to be joyful? And thus you create a more humane environment where you can be more creative, you can be more innovative. It's about collaboration, co-creation. And this can make all the difference. And this fourth question is, it, it creates or opens like a human space or invites a human factor into the workplace. It doesn't weigh anything, doesn't cost anything. It's very practical. It's very simple. Just by asking, what is it that makes me happy today? And now, of course, it could be, I'm just happy right now. That's fine. And then the question is like, what, what, does, it help, what does it take to sustain this happiness? Or uh, how can I bring in more joy today? Um, what am I grateful for, et cetera? It's... It's a very simple question. And sometimes people are overwhelmed by it because they're just like, oh, I have to function, I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do that. No, just slow down. What is it that makes you happy today? And I have had some, you know, I just can encourage you to start with this very simple question. What is it that, that makes the, this day special? Um, you, can, you can play with that question, but you know, bring in something which is not maybe necessary directly related to work, which brings, which allows you to bring in some of yourself. And um, you can do this by yourself. You can do this in the team and you can start today or tomorrow. I love that. There is more than now in any other time in history. And I, I think it's just because we're moving faster and faster towards the future. Um, exponentially in many, many different ways. Um, even during a pandemic, it's unbelievable how uh, fast the calendar moves, how fast the time moves, even though a lot of people have just been at home most of the time. And um, I've heard numerous times, I don't have time for that. I'm busy. I'm sorry. You know, 
you're working from the home office and, and you don't, you, you still don't have time the, whether things become more complex or hard. Um, the real question is with this dissatisfaction in our lives, mainly around work that, that we're experiencing and that this has gotten worse um, and, and is continuing to get worse. So it's not getting better in many, many respects. Although I've, I've heard some great feedback that people are really enjoying the new visions of working from home and how they've reconnected with family, which is a, which is a positive thing. How, no, knowing that, how do, and you, you're talking about the joys of that and that, that it's higher than ever. How do we, how do we fix that? How do we shift the paradigm so that that we enjoy our lives that those two polar opposites that the work life balance is is aligned and that we're not saying ah, i'm so unsatisfied with my job i don't want to see the people i work with i don't enjoy it and i need to find these nuggets and these moments of 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 joy in my day that those two worlds come together is there a way to do that? Is there some things that you're seeing that are improving that? Or is that getting further and further apart as we move in the future? Is that why people are quitting? That's why they're not returning to the jobs that they, they had before. Um, I think the verdict is still out. Uh, it's too, probably too, too, too early to, to, to tell. Um, this is an ongoing discussion, you know, um, in various companies. Uh, you know, I don't have the simple right answer, I'm afraid. Um, I think there are lots of advantages of working at home, even though there are lots of, you know, professions that, you know, they, they can work from home. And uh, it's, it's a blessing, actually, for them. Um, I think it needs to be balanced. I like to work, you know, be, be flexible and, you know, we're lucky that we can't do this, but um, say when you're a pharmacist, for example, you, 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 of course you have to go to the pharmacy or people who work in infrastructure, they, they, you know, they have to go out or, or the doctors, et cetera, you know, and so many other people on the front line. Um, the, the, the world of work is definitely changing. Um, I think we need to find a, a good balance. Uh, the question though is in the digital, let's say, well, right now we, we're used to working 40 hours a week. Uh, okay, if we say the new normal is 20 hours, we would fill the 20 hours and probably be maybe even more productive. You know, what kind of, how do we want to work? And the question is like, what are we going to do with the, the, the 20 hours of which we have all of a sudden? Is it that we don't know how to spend them with our family and friends? Um, what if we have to work 50 hours or 60 hours or maybe just 10 hours because like the machines are taking over our work and that does not mean that we, we're out of work, but we can be more, become more creative. And um, I think it would be sad if we were overwhelmed by the opportunity of working only having to work 20 hours, you know, full, full pay, you know, full salary, but only 20 hours uh, a week. And then question, okay, what am I going to do with the remaining 20 hours? And, oh, gee, I have no idea. How sad. Because if that's, if this is like a risk, one is to think about what we're going to do about how do we want to live? What is it that we still want to do? And my, maybe, why not just do something for our planet, for our society and give back and, and think about the, the next generation and um, exploring who we are, reflecting on what our, you know, what other skills we have, what other talents we have and see what we can do, you know, how we can better the, the planet. I love that. I have three, three more questions left for you. Um, and that that last one was probably the hardest because I, I think that in, in your book, you really address how to, to flip that paradigm from job dissatisfaction to being in a place working for yourself or working for some someone else when you feel it's human business and you're part of it, you're not a number, that that job dissatisfaction or that uh, integral part of that organization or that organism where you're working towards really changes how you feel and see the world, how you interact with 
what's going on in the world and that you play a part um, and it, it can it can make a big difference and i i i highly recommend that uh, everybody go out and read your book because the nuggets of wisdom are there how you can um, you can get to a better place how you can make business more humane um, if there was one message that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, even two messages, what would it be your messages? That's a tough one. <laughs> you should have told me earlier. I could have thought about it. Um, um, have the courage to break out of old patterns, reflect and break out of old patterns and find out who you really are. Um, don't try to play a role or meet other people's expectations and compromise your own inner truth. And um, there's, those are two, two, it's more than two sentences. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. No, you're um, fine. That's and, fine. The, and the thing is like, here's the thing. Next time you make a, have a, you have a difficult choice to make. Listen to your heart consciously listen to your heart turn off the brain and see what happens it could be a simple thing just like do i make a left or right turn you know uh, or it could be something grander it's, it's you know whatever but consciously make the decision okay next time i listen to my my heart and see what happens I love that. And, you know, um, we've talked many times and, and, and even on our previous recording podcast, courage is a big, big theme and factor in your life. A lot of people don't know, and I'm not revealing anything that's not available in your books or on your website, but you're, you like um, nature, the outdoors, you like martial arts, or you did martial arts for a while. You like to ski, you like winter sports, you you're, you're very active. You're trying to be mindful and you've taken a lot of courageous steps in your life. And, and so I love that you share that, uh, your wisdom and your knowledge with us to say, Hey, do the same, you know, it's worked good for me. And I would suggest that it works good for you as well. Uh, give it a try. Um, you've all already kind of answered this question before, but I'm going to, Brevi it again, and that is, what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far, even though you're still on that journey that you would have loved to know from the start before you said, I wish I would have started earlier, <laughs> I'd be much further along, but is there anything else? Is there something to say? Um, it's okay to show weaknesses. You don't have to be brave all the time. It's okay to show weaknesses. We don't have to. We don't have to be perfect. And just trying to be perfect is just like it's more of an expression of um, lack of self worth. And um, don't try to be perfect. It's it's like it's it's our imperfection that makes us special. And showing weakness, uh, vulnerability can actually be strength. And um, that's something that I'm, I'm still struggling with uh, quite often, I admit. And every time I consciously make the, the choice of showing a weakness in a given situation, uh, it surprises me again and again, uh, and the other person too. But it's like and very, very, very seldom, you know, does the other person trying to kill me and criticize me, but usually they're also surprised and they're willing to help. And showing weaknesses, can actually be strength. Bren Brown really talks about vulnerability in her TED Talks and her books and, and really ha has been that. And, and But you as well, you, you've come out and said that several times. Um, why can, can I dive deeper? Why is it so hard for you to be vulnerable, to be honest, to... What, why do you or why do you struggle with it? Why? What, what's the what why why are other people struggling with it? Why why is it hard? 
Is it because we believe the world needs to work a, a certain way or we okay. expect it? It's well, this goes back, you know, into very old childhood. We would need that <laughs> two hours ago. But I think uh, it is as human beings, we have we need kind of like comfort and we need love. And we look for this comfort and love and appreciation on the outside world. And yes, we can look outside, but it's only superficial. It's all within us. And consciously, I, I understand this, but often I still have to experience it. And this is uh, like, in the, like I said, like in the middle of a journey, but this is like, um, yeah, it's kind of like it has to do with self-love, not egotism or anything, but it's more self-compassion. And it's, a, it's kind of like a silly when you say we're talking about the pursuit of happiness. Pursuit of happiness, the happiness is with the, inside of us. Okay, so why do you want to pursue happiness on the outside? It's inside of us. Okay? It's, we, we just need to find a way. I mean, how can we access it? It's already there. And it's, we have all the other stuff you know, on, on top you know, and other people's expectations, but actually it's inside of us. It's the simple things. You can, you can buy castles, you can buy cars, what have Okay, this is like superficial, temporary pleasure and what have you, but it's all inside of us. And, and this is like feeling, experiencing this, I think can be completely fulfilling. And I, I'm trying to, to explore it and expand on it. And um, um, looking for more advice, you know, people who can say, well, how can, how we can expand on it even, even more? But I think this is, a key, um, making our life more, um, more human, you can say. Uh, it's all inside of us. And that's maybe that's the purpose of our life, to, to actually acknowledge who we really are. I love that. And, and we've talked about this before as well. Um, I think you really surmised everything so nicely and hit the nail on the head. The answer is already within us. We've got to be able to listen. We've got to be able to ask them for ourselves. We, uh, I tend to say sometimes, let's not be lazy and and expect that somebody else has done the work and asked the questions or found the answers for us. Let's dig into us and ask our questions of ourselves, and um, the answers are there. Thomas, thank you so much for letting us all inside of your ideas the spirit of human business how to rediscover our human being to shape our future i love it it was a great read i'm glad i got my copy we're gonna i'm gonna have to get this one signed because it came right from your publishing company uh, from you next time i see it but it's been a sheer pleasure it's always great to see you thank you for taking the time to, to speak with us and that's all I have, unless you have one final nuggets of no. wisdom to add that you missed. Uh, well, no, thank you for the for the time, the dialogue, and, and the provocative, uh, thought-provoking uh, questions. Uh, I still have to think about tonight and the next couple of days. And I, you know, um, looking forward to our next dialogue on this next uh, ideas exchange and uh, looking forward to a dialogue with um, all the listeners. Thank you so much. I'm going to put the links where they can get the book and all your website and everything else so that they'll see it in the show notes. And I, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks so much, Thomas. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.